any questions? Yes. So do you have some specific examples for, for some of these? Episodes? That's in my 201 talk. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, to, let me just grab one in particular. So you talked about how best practices kind of take, take, a, take a bite out of the middle and don't serve either the low end or the high end very well. So do you have, like, a specific example of that? Password rotation. Solution? Hmm? Password rotation is the classic example. Okay. That's what got me thinking about this. Who rotates their passwords every 30 days? Every 90 days? A few more people? You know why? Because we're told to. Because we're forced to. Exactly. Because we're told to. Do you remember NT? Windows NT. You know how Windows NT stored passwords? Stored in a Landman database. Landman hashes were known to be weak. But they had to be weak because the hardware that NT was running on was weak. So you needed to have passwords that could be decrypted quickly by the system. Or it's not really decrypted, but hashed quickly because the systems didn't have a lot of power. And at the time that they were released and the 90-day rule came out, you could crack a landman password in about 100 days. So if you rotated them every 90 days, if somebody stole your database, by the time you cracked it, it didn't matter. As technology evolved and systems got faster, you wound up with a situation where it could be cracked in about 45 days. So everybody changed the password window to 30 days. And when technology got better, people started going, you know, we can't really make people change passwords every day. It's not workable. So it got stuck. It got put into best practice as you change passwords every 90 days. Ignoring the fact that if you're not running NT, it didn't matter. If you're running a well-configured 2008 box, it didn't matter. If you're running Linux, it didn't matter. If you're running an ice cream parlor, it didn't matter. You know, there are a lot of places where, even when the rule made sense, it didn't apply. And it became best practice. It's in PCI. It's in HIPAA. It's probably in you know, the various 27,000 series buried in there somewhere. But it doesn't always make sense. Okay. In reality, you have a certain group of people that simply don't have data that's behind a password that's worth protecting to a point where rotating passwords at all makes sense. At the more complex level, you have ones that are being highly targeted. You know, if you're a Google, or if you're you know, the federal government, people are trying to get in. And in that case, the solution isn't to change passwords every 90 days. <coughs> it's to use a second factor that automatically rotates every minute. Okay. Those are the two sides. What we're doing is stuck in the middle and hardly applies to anybody anymore. Is that a good example? Mm -hmm. why, why is it eight? What? Why is it, why was it eight? Oh, eight, eight characters? Yeah. That's because of DES. Because if seven characters you went to the second hash, which uh, multiplied this. In, in land map, it's true, yeah. And if you're uh, if you're running a anybody here run Solaris? Okay. Solaris by default uses DES encryption. Still? Well, as of a year ago. Okay, I don't know what happens if they would go to Oracle, but history doesn't indicate it's positive. Um, <laughs> if you log in, if you have a complex password on a standard Solaris box that you haven't modified the encryption on, like, I had a 14-character password on the system I was logging into, and I typo. My fingers, you, you know how when you typo, your fingers know you typo, but you hit enter anyway? And it logged me in. I thought, that's weird. I typoed after the eighth character. He was using DES. <coughs> I only looked at the first eight characters. It didn't matter how long the password was. VNC does that, too. VNC? Which VNC? Type it real? The when VNC, like the standard for VNC is to use a, a, a static S encryption key in port with only one lock using those eight characters. It, like various VNCs, um, various other VNCs like real VNC have chosen to different ways, but okay. by default all the Windows based ones do that. And I think the Windows ones do. Probably. Probably. 
Yes. So do you have any, any ideas of how to or at least get maybe two sets of standard practices for different groups of people rather than this, you know, one overarching set of standards that don't apply to anybody? Um, actually, yes. The that goes back to the, the old military model, uh, which it feels odd to be referencing military when you're talking about agile development. Um, they have a concept of goal and mission. And there's actually that this hierarchy. That basically, if you're engaging in a battle, the general of the battle is going to say, these are the things that matter, and hand it down to the commanders to have them figure out how to do it. And it goes down and down and down and actually have a well-structured system that will help, you know, each, each layer has their own level of responsibility. And that's kind of why you have so many ridiculous rules, because, you know, each group has developed the rules and written them down and it gets to this massive book. What we wind up with, if you do it at a, a corporate level, is you say, okay, I've got these three teams, and our goal is to have these things done by the end of the uh, by the end of the quarter, go do it. Okay. If you're doing security, you know one team's goal might be you need to protect these passwords. I don't care how you do it, you have to protect the passwords, and they figure that out. And if they do a good job, you're good. If they do a bad job, you fire them and you get a new team. Okay. You can have a team in charge of data. You can have a team in charge of something else. The goal is to pick, the, or the point is to pick the teams such that by working together, they can build their own sets of practices that make sense and have well-defined interfaces to who they need to talk to that also make sense. It's basically modular programming and an information security environment. obvious to you may not be obvious to others. Okay, you need to get everybody together. The flashes on your phones are not helping your phones. Just just point that out. Right. But my hobby is photography. It's got um, the auto on. It's thinking for me. <laughs> um, before you get to this point, you have to have a conversation around what's worth protecting and what's not. Because left to their own devices, information security teams will overprotect. Okay. Um, if they're not left to their own devices, they'll underprotect. Because generally speaking, people that wind up in technology, people that wind up in security, and actually singer-songwriters, as I've learned, hate communicating with others. Fundamental part of the personality that attracts people to these kinds of jobs. We don't like communicating with other people, which means we have communication problems all the time. So, if you want to take this approach, you need to figure out what level of failure is acceptable and recoverable from, and what level of failure is not. I know very few organizations that have media proof rules. <laughs> Say it again. 
I know very few organizations that have meteor proof, proof rooms. But technically, it would be a meteor right if once it had proof. Oh, come on. No laughs for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard it hurts against death lasers. <laughs> Sorry? I heard it hurts in that. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Could you show the uh, tech versus the tool slide? Sure. This is not a complete list. Somebody else? Oh, I think you had your hand raised. Oh, yes. Do you have an idea of what percentage of companies? Fifty or more, very very few. Five hundred or more, a whole lot. Could you repeat the question, please? The question was, how many companies in the Twin Cities area that have fifty or more employees are ISO twenty-seven thousand compliant? Yes. A couple moments ago, you uh, described a scenario where you had these two different teams, each tasked with their own uh, responsibility. The example you gave was, okay, your your team responsibility is protecting passengers. Right. And it sounded like you were advocating that model. Because when, when you, when you okay. mentioned that, it made me think of your diagram where you talked about, the, the example was IT versus management, and each of them were focusing on the things that were important to them. And, <coughs> and, and that's what I thought of when you talked about this model. What's the difference between that and what you're... Okay. It's, it's a problem of scale. And anybody know what Dunbar's number is? Actually, debatable. 150 is the max. Yeah. Dunbar's number is a measure of the number of connections, like personal connections, a human mind can handle. So you tend to see people form groups of around 100. Okay. Tribes are about 100. Small business tends to hit about 100. Then when it grows beyond that, weird things happen. Um, there are organizations that have structured around Dunbar's number. I've forgotten the name of a consulting company out in the, the East Coast, but it actually builds offices of 100 people. And when one of them grows bigger, they break into two sets of 50, move somewhere else, and grow into 100. Okay? The problem between management and security or management and IT wanting to talk is if you get to an organization that's so large, which I'm guessing is the organization you were referencing, you've got over 100 managers, or over 100 people in this team, or over 100 people in this team, they're not going to, you're not going to be able to get 200 people together and have a great. It's just not going to happen. It's hard enough within 100. And within 100, that only works because we have alpha hierarchies going on. So what you need to do is find ways to communicate between those groups. Basically, treat this group as a module, this group as a module, and you have a handful of people working on um, basically communication negotiation between those sets. Now, in the smaller space, yes, you could have management, which might be five people, talking with IT, which might be five people, and saying, okay, what are we going to do? Does that make sense? Really? You're just now getting in? <laughs> so, really? But there's not. Okay. I, one of my pieces on why we fail at security is we're really bad at incentivizing direct behavior. And, like, because, like, what's my, as a security person, what's my incentive to not lose my job? Okay. Probably. Like, it should be something else, but. I would say we're really bad at defining correct behavior. Yep. Well, um, an example is, okay, has anybody wondered why we still have small businesses? I mean, if security were really as bad as it is you know, in the small business space, which I've been in the small business space, and I can tell you, it's pretty bad. Shouldn't they all have been stolen out of business by now? You know, it, it, yes? There are a lot of them. Yes, there are a lot of them. But I think they're all a little different. 
I, I think there's something else going on. And, I, and this is actually an ongoing research project, if anybody wants to catch me afterwards and talk about this. It is quite likely that small businesses are thriving in the same space that large businesses are thriving, despite having vastly different levels of security, because small businesses tend to have more empowered people. And th there's a tendency in humans of risk acceptance, where if somebody else provides protection for you, you will take greater levels of risk because you feel more comfortable doing so. And there's some interesting evidence that that might be happening in the IT space. My research isn't done, I need to get a second phase going, but it, it's looking interesting. Okay. Could you reiterate where you covered the lead parts? Basically, the, the lead part to the synopsis would be have 80% of overlapping security or, or the, the lean, security. The lean comes from lean manufacturing where it references waste reduction. And so the lead would basically be don't over engineer your security and stick, stick at 80%. That's or the, I'm trying to think of, oh, well, you like well, a one line <coughs> tell to a manager. Right. The, that's one of the areas that lean comes into. Another is focus on learning, so you're not going in these doing cycles and not actually providing value to the organization. You know, think about what you're doing, which gets back to, to, to the point of if you're incentivizing people to learn, right. the good comes out of that. Right. If you're incentivizing people to do, you're protecting against the successful attacks that have happened in the past, not what's coming in the future. Exactly, and you end up having best practices, and like for password rotation, that incentivize me to create crummy passwords instead of creating good passwords, which are not maintainable at the high rotation device. Yes. yes, incentivizing people is hard. And the only thing I've found that works is to incentivize in learning, hire good people, and trust that good work comes out of that process because this is actually my 201 talk. If you incentivize people based on metrics, people are really good at bending the metrics to meet their incentives. Right, and that's why we have things like the stock traders who don't make their hedging bets because they make more, they get a bigger bonus. Right. Stock market's a fascinating psychological study, which is way off topic, but it's, there's really neat stuff going on yeah. Could you give some examples about incentivizing by learning or incentivizing learning? Um, it depends on the type of people you have. Um, while I'm not one, despite the letters after my name, to say to go after certifications for certification's sake, incentivizing people to get one certification a year and to have that certification be something different from what they usually do is very good. I actually learned a lot by going for my CISSP. Not because the CISSP itself is a good measurement of somebody that's really good at what they do, but because the, the 10 domain system that they have required me to learn something outside of what I've done. The same thing applied when I went after my RHCE. I've been running Linux for years by that point. But that test tested me on stuff I never encountered, so I had to learn. So certifications are good because you're forced to learn things you wouldn't otherwise. And actually, on my personal blog, I, I have a metric you can use to pick ones that maximize the learning to dollar ratio. If that's of interest, we can talk afterwards too. So you, that's one way to do it. Um, another way is to measure people based on how many talks get accepted. It's how many blog articles they write. You know, require them to do things that require them to learn. You know, if you know them personally, if you're managing a very small team, you can say, you, know, you are weak in the sand. So your task, you know, if you can build a new one and connect it to this system and have it pass these stable metrics in the next week, I'm going to throw you an extra hundred bucks on your page. Stuff like that. That approach doesn't scale well. So in the big businesses, they tend to be sort of certification and can, you know, CPE heavy. Don't go for CPEs. That system's way too easy to manipulate. Anything else? Oh, sorry, just 
sum it up, measure learning by measuring teaching because that's measurable. And in order to teach, you have to have learned. What's your context inside Sure. With luck, this presentation will be converted to a comic book by the end of the month, and I'll be putting the link out on the link security group. Yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, what is the next version of the security? Uh, 201? Uh, two, 201 is something I do with my, my company. If Alex wanted me to come back in a few months and do a 201, I certainly could do that. It's, there's an awful lot of overlap, but I'm, I'm working. You know, it started as one concept, and it's separating. So. It's not fully separate yet, but if you want the review, I'll gladly do it. So sometime in the fall, maybe. Yep, sounds good. So, and if you give your contact information to my company, I'm sure they'll spam you every time I do something nearby. Anything else?